everyone. Welcome to Studio Sunday. We hope all is well with you. It's scorching hot here in Houston, over 100 for the last few days. I think we have one more day and then it's going to break. Okay. So we're staying inside whether we have COVID or not. So yeah. it's nasty out. Can't wait for October when it'll drop down into the high 80s. <laughs> You know, usually in the summertime in Houston is when we all get kind of pale and out of shape because we can't go outside. It's the, it's the opposite of the rest of the world. So you, you get pale and out of shape only in the summer? Yeah, in the wintertime. I am tan and... Really? Yeah, that's the rumor. Interesting. Which day is that? I'm going to mark it on my calendar. <laughs> oh, gosh. One of those days. Okay, speaking of October, uh, Terry started sketching for our online event, which will be October 23rd through the 25th. <clears throat> I think I'm going to call it the Terry Moore Live weekend, because you're going to be live. You're going to do a lot of live panels. You're going to do live Q&As. You're going to do live giveaways. It's all about you that weekend, babe. Maybe that's the weekend you should be in shape. This is weird, because I'm always hearing it's not about you, but that weekend, it's about me. It is. That's We're going to call it Terry Moore Live. <laughs> and okay. everybody watch because this is the weekend he's going to be in shape. Uh, what? Yeah. That'll be your one weekend. Oh, okay. <laughs> Prepare for it. Good. Okay, also, something's going on with Rachel Rising out there. Does anybody know what it is? The omnibuses, we cannot keep them in stock, and Diamond's selling out of them. So we've sent more from our printer, but... Um, hmm. It's just like in the last three weeks, it's just kind of gone crazy. Oh, so I don't know what's going on. I'm hoping that people just now are having time to find it and read that big giant book. Yeah, I have seen uh, tweets, you know, saying I'm reading it. Um, I see more tweets, but that's my marker. Well, it's fun to see uh, more people discovering it. Yes. I can't wait to hear what they think about those scenes, like the snake thing and the finger thing. Oh. <laughs> What's the finger thing? Right. Oh. Oh, that is so gross. Anyway, there's Zoe as a, as a kind of comic relief, if you can call her a comic relief. <laughs> a serial killer yeah. comic relief. <laughs> so anyway, something's going on out there. I'm glad you guys are reading it. Thank you. Okay, I want to thank everyone for participating in our unscientific poll regarding individual issues versus trades or graphic novels. It seems relatively split out there. Really? Uh, so I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Make up our own mind. I think you're enjoying the graphic novel process, aren't you? I, I am. The deadline concerns me because I've never quite had this deadline, you know, where I don't have anything due month to month, but by October, the state. And you are not good with the long deadline. No, because it freaks me out. Well, um, you like you work better under pressure. Yeah. So I think you work better with a monthly deadline as opposed to, oh, four months from now, this is due. Because you wait until the week before and think, oh, I have 50 pages left. <laughs> That's my nightmare, yeah. it, is I have one week left and 25 yeah. pages to draw. That's impossible. Yeah. But, you know, I'm used to the monthly where... It's due on Monday and Friday. I still have five pages. I can stay up all weekend and do that. I can relate to that. I'm used to it. But, you know, yeah. 75 pages due in October? You can do it. <laughs> Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe the next week we go back to the individual issues. Yeah. We'll maybe. have to figure it out. Yeah. Okay, just a reminder that the final trade of five years, which is stalemate, is uh, in the web store. And we also have new, uh, we have the 2020 sketchbook back in stock. So if you need those, you can go to the website and order them. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Moore? I like those books. So I'm glad that they exist. So check them out. That's what you're adding? Yeah, that's my ad. Okay. I added the art. Okay. Are you ready for the hot seat? I am. Literally the hot seat. Oh yeah, 100 degrees. Okay, the first question is interesting. Do you enjoy going to conventions and meeting fans, or is it easier not to know who's reading your books? Do fans ever reshape where you're going with your story? Oh, it's dangerous if you let, you know, the fans really uh, take over um, your head. Uh, it's better to stay in your own space 
and um, kind of uh, dive into this wilderness of imagination and it's just you trying to chart your own course. If you do it with a lot of group decisions, like the fans, uh, that's like having a committee and you know, created it by a committee. Fan fiction. Yeah, and fan fiction it becomes fan fiction. What we really want to see is just this all the time, maybe the polling, but that's not really it doesn't work if it's by itself. It needs the whole thing. So you've seen that happen on TV shows where, you know, the second, third season kind of fall apart because they got such a big reaction on one aspect of the show, they focus on that, uh, say Willow and Tara or something. And next thing you know, well, from Buffy. Uh, so next thing you know, that's a big deal. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Well, it was like 20 years ago. <laughs> well, I was thinking about it because I was thinking of, well, never mind. Okay, let's see one that happened today. Killing Eve. Killing Eve. Say everybody falls in love with Eve and Villanelle and they want the show just to be about those two hanging out all together all the time. And you lose all the background. Yeah, yeah. you do. Wait a minute, did I just describe season three? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so how do you feel about going to conventions? Do you like meeting your fans? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you do, too. Um, it puts a... It's, it's our chance to have human contact. You're, you, otherwise, if you just sit here and just draw, and then you put it out in the FTP and, and the mail, you, and it's like putting a, a message in a bottle and putting it out in the ocean. It's wonderful if somebody brings the bottle back to you and says, I found this, and I read it and loved it. I mean, that's, you're hoping somebody reads it and... You're feeling differently about conventions now than you did a year ago. I am. <laughs> a year ago, a convention was an interruption in my deadlines. Yeah. Now it's like human contact. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I really miss our friends. And I had a Zoom call uh, last week with um, four friends that uh, usually I see at shows. Man, it was so good to see those guys. You know, so... Well, this too shall pass. Yes. We'll get back there. Yes. Okay, on to question two. I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about creating only fiction work. Would you ever consider doing nonfiction? Absolutely, I would. I have considered doing something on, say, Lizzie Borden um, and other people who have, you know, really not been... Well, a lot of it has been done with Lizzie Borden, but... Um, you know, there's other characters out there, other people in history, that uh, would be good to have a contemporary story. Would you ever do an autobiographical thing? <laughs> I did, that would be boring. I mean, and then he spent the next 20 years at, uh, at the table. <laughs> <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing about uh, biographies about creative people is, say, I remember... The, if you read a biography about a, uh, one of the great composers or a, a pop star or a rock musician, they tend to talk about their personal life, which is the worst thing they have going for them. What the greatest thing they have going for them is their their creative ideas. But nobody really uh, can relate to that, so you end up talking about where they lived and who they dated and how they broke up. and. That was the messes of their life. The great thing in their life was what they did with their instrument or the creativity. So it's nice if once in a while you'll see a book about somebody's creativity. Um, that's that's really what makes them special. Not not the mess that is their personal life. So you're not doing autobiographical. You'll do about somebody else maybe at some point down the road. Yeah, I would be very interested in that. I, I've noticed uh, some people are very inspired by a, a creative person that is come and gone. And uh, they know a lot about them. Uh, those kind of people would be, it'd be interesting to see a biography about the old person from that new person who has been totally influenced by them. Just knows everything about them. And dedicates their work to them. That would be interesting. But that, that wouldn't be you. I can't think of one particular source you know I, I cite a couple of 20th century cartoonists and artists but um yeah no no big one since i okay well what about you do you have a sensei 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 oh you have one of those too 
Help me, people. I, th I have. The, I use the Texas accent version. Since I. Oh, honey, you're hurting me. <laughs> I'm, I'm what are you drawing today? Oh, um, well, I've had several questions. Um, I lost my little post-it note. But uh, people have asked me about um, um, how to, how do I decide on backgrounds, the emphasis of backgrounds, and um, when to zoom in on a story, which sounds like um, would be a quick answer, but what it is, it's all about storytelling. How close do you want to be getting to and away from your subject, and what you do subliminally influences whether you're pulling the reader in or having them back off for emotional reasons. Um, so there is actually something to it. So I thought maybe it'd be interesting to talk about that. It's a, it's a part of the craft of comic book craft that maybe doesn't get enough uh, attention. So maybe it's a good thing to look at. Okay. That sounds good. Okay, I'm going to go uh, get out of my jammies. <laughs> <laughs> See, you guys have no idea. I'm in my jammies. It's time to get out of them. <laughs> With their bunny slippers. <laughs> oh, Lord. So, everybody have a good week. Stay cool. We'll see you next Sunday. And Terry will be back with you momentarily. Okay. Meet me here. Another doodle. Okay. So, um, we're going to talk about the framing of the story pacing. So, this one was really complicated for me. It's um, a, an issue of five years, and it happens in Moscow. Uh, and I needed to um, pay my dues and show something of that famous city. And they have this big river with the bridges running right through it. Um, so that was a good landmark for me, as opposed to uh, you know the the old building that is in the town square. So this is where I wanted my scene to take place. So I had to go to all the trouble to draw this elaborate background to establish a sense of place. This is your main beauty shot at the front end of the scene or the front end of the movie. This is how you know, get your bearings. And then uh, go into a wide panorama shot of one section of this river where they have, you know, the... Um, the barrier up to the street, the river, and then you can see one little figure there. So now we have a target, and I go in, it's like a crane shot that went into here, and you now you can see somebody's over this bridge, the bridge that he's walking up under, and who is that on the bridge? You go to this cut angle and get this person's point of view, and this is actually Zoe. So Zoe is on the bridge and she is walking, watching the guy, and now you can see that he's actually approaching another person. And here are the cut to the other two people, and now we're at the other person's point of view, which is Rachel. So, in this sequence, what I've tried to do is Moscow, uh, street scene person, here they are being watched by this person, and here comes the other uh, converse, the, the triangle, the third person. So we now know we have three people on a bridge, in, under a bridge in Moscow. And you go to close up of him having a personal moment. You're right up with him as if you're his friend. You move to the side and watch the girl walk up, Rachel. Two shot conversation uh, over the shoulder at him, <clears throat> over the shoulder at him because he gets the priority in this exchange, then over his shoulder at her because she, her expression and how she's delivering it is important. Um, then show the, the two shot where it looks like, you know, he's still watching to see if they're being watched. She's totally focused on him. This is a sign of weakness. She is able to make contact on him. He is looking for danger or if he's in trouble. So this is your first red flag that this guy, uh, she has the advantage. He walks up under the bridge because he wants to be in hiding and it's safer. She follows him in there. He talks, his stoop-shouldered and his furtive look uh, behind a cloud of smoke and the habit of smoking. It's just a nervous habit. 
this guy is now starting to look like prey. She has the focus of a cat who is watching prey in the jungle. So now he argues back and he does what he knows how to do best. Uh, uh, what is it called? Fear and force. Uh, fear and force are the two, the only two tools that a criminal mind has. Um, she's not going for it. She looks at him and sighs heavily and calls him by name. He suddenly realizes as the steam is escaping his lungs, no steam has ever been escaping her lungs. And he, he pauses for a moment, surprised, looking at him. Where is your breath? And she says, okay, Zoe. And we're getting a look really close on the back of this guy at her face. And that's on purpose because now we are standing right behind him. She is still maintaining eye contact with him. But she says, okay, Zoe. Cut to a close-up. Zoe is going after his Achilles tendon with a pair of garden shears. Snap! The tendon rolls it right up his leg. And down he goes. Okay, that was all to get you to this point. As they now fight to pull his coat off and look for something on his body, which is a little um, computer disk, um, thumb drive. Uh, show, the, show him wailing out, hitting show from her point of view um, and now you're starting to see the river notice that that's important fight and he pushes her over into the river this is an important shot uh, behind Zoe looking at the scene as the river the uh, circle for where they fell into the water closes up the river gets quiet and covers them up rot row and this was a really hard sequence here. I would, went vertical panels to show that they are sinking. And he tries pushing her down with his foot. Then he tries to swim back up. And she is grabbing for his foot, she, which is the hurt one, and pulls him right back down. They're getting deeper in the water. She puts her thumb in there. So I wanted a close-up to show that how she is grabbing him. The pain, don't let all your breath out. Pulling him down by that to get the uh, thumb drive that's taped to the back. He's just trying to get to the top. She pulls him back down. Now I'm trying to show that they are sinking. And I use the same um, framing, but we're going in closer and closer to show who is in control. And what you're seeing here is that she is not struggling for breath. He is struggling for breath. And he finally lets it all go into one last... Uh, oxygen bubble and she holds on to them as they sink sink and then she gets on top grabs him by the chin and foot on shoulders and uh, snaps his neck and then lets him go so and all that stuff happening underwater trying to show sinking things like that uh, getting wide enough so that you can see the action and then backing off and one of the things about this framing here is that you're hoping to see, um, to, to see perspective, that they're in the middle of this deep water. It's murky and dirty, cold, but it also gets very quiet. And all you're hearing under here are these whale sounds. Ooh, oof, 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 like that. It sounds like, you know, whale sounds underwater. And then it's very quiet. And he sinks to the bottom of that ice cold river. Cut back to the wide shot and the water she's been waiting it's all quiet on the surface wait 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 there she pops up in the in the distance swims toward her and then gets out and that's that that's that sequence i thought that was a really hard sequence for me to draw um, i struggled with it it took me over a week to draw the whole thing to get it right um, it plays quickly when you read it but Man, that one kicked my butt. Okay, let's look at a different kind of scene here. Uh, if you're in a room and you want to show an action sequence, um, this is a scene from Rachel Rising. Um, there's a nurse in the hospital room with uh, Jet, who is possessed by uh, Satan, basically, or a demon. And you, uh, she's talking to the nurse 
The nurse is looking at Zoe in the bed. Conversation. She says something that is not normal. The nurse reacts. The nurse says, you know, I think I have to go do something. Because she sees a, a red flag in this conversation. Looking at her, her trying to say, look, you know, I'll find a good place for this child. And close up on Jet, uh, as she considers that, and close up on her expression, says, you know what? That doesn't work for me. And she's in with standing in place, she reaches out and grabs the nurse's hair. Uh, the nurse was on her, walking forward, so this is a pullback on the hair, just locking in with the fist. Using the fist, boom, pulls that uh, head, head first, straight down into the uh, ground. So I wanted to show a, an, a, a sweeping, arcing motion here. That's why the swish is sideways. Um, and then from the ground up on this one to show that uh, the head hit the ground first. Um, so it's, I was, you're actually trying to do a strange thing there, which is from this angle, show the swoop, what happens this way. From behind, the, the swoop happens from the opposite direction. So I don't know if this is actually comic book craft correct, but it's, it's how I tried to do it. So now you go to the overhead shot um, the crane shot, um, and now we're looking down at this the setting. So now we can see all three, status check, still in bed, oblivious to this, uh, standing over the victim. Now leaning down back down to the floor, it's like, it's like a crane shot. The, the camera goes down, and as it goes down, uh, Zoe kneels and gets down into the face of the victim and says, still with us? And she checks the eyes. And because the pupils and the eyes are still in sync, um, she knows that um, she doesn't have the effect she wants. So she says, let me help. Grabs the head, smacks it down really hard again on the marble floor. And now the eyes are disjointed. And now you have brain damage. There you go. That's what she wanted. Isn't that evil? <laughs> that is, that's... Awful. Um, to finish out the scene, go back to her standing, a few details, grabs the water, pours a little cup, cup of water, pours it by the foot, scoots the foot into it, um, and then stands over the scene of the crime. Uh, it looks like she slipped on water. Uh, oh, call for help. So, that's how I did a scene in a room. Um, there was the five years scene. Okay, maybe from a story that you may have seen more. Uh, not everybody has seen five years and Rachel Rising. Here's a scene with Kachu that I always liked. Um, she's out for a walk. And then uh, three beats behind her, this guy is following her. And um, by the stoop shoulders and just the uh, lack of a uh, stylish haircut. <laughs> and of course the goatee, anybody with a goatee is evil. We all know that. Excuse me, miss. And then this is just a two framing shot because now what it is is his brain talking into getting into her head and all you have to go by is the facial expressions. It doesn't matter what's going on from the shoulders down at this point. All that matters is what was on the expression of his face when he said that and the expression of her face when she heard it. So that's why, dun, 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 wide shot, wide shot, established the scene. Boom. This is like they walk on stage. Now, the delivery of the first line. And then you cut to him. And all you get is a glint of his eye out of the shadow of his cap. Uh, hey, would you happen to know the time? I don't think he said it that chippy, but and she pulls her hand out of her jacket and says, "Sure, it's 4:30." Um, and her hand is holding a um, what is that? Probably a Glock 22. And so she's standing there with this, looking at it, and now he is 
He's probably got something like, he may have something like that in his pocket too. But now he just stares at her and she stares right back at him with the gun in her hand and notice, finger on the trigger. She doesn't say another word. He walks around her, close up on her. That is just pure defiance. That is the look of the devil walking by. I'll get you next time. Or, you know. <clears throat> this is like when you get a close up of King Kong and his eyes roll and watch you walk by and he growls. So that was a little interplay that was all about setting it up, uh, medium uh, close up on the faces, time it so that it's foreground, background. Um, also notice that the background is as simple as possible because I really don't want you looking inside the glass building or looking at the bark of the tree or a, you know, a bird. All I want you to really focus on is these guys. You managed to know that they were outside walking just by enough, there's just enough information. When he delivers this line, there is no background because I don't want you looking at the street or a bad drawing of a car or maybe you didn't like this tree or a trash can or a park bench. It doesn't matter. All that mattered was these two people talking. So the background went away. Um, background went away here because all that mattered was this. I wanted you to see this, not this. And then I wanted you to see the standoff, the silent standoff. And again, here we are. I could have made this, you know, uh, the leaves and a bird and bark and a squirrel and a couple walking in the background. But that would have taken away from this whole dynamic right here. This is a very, very, very tense moment right here. Um, Kachu just avoided what would be a... Most women would have been a victim. Their next 20 minutes would have gone really badly. But this is Kachu. And because she pulls a gun out of her hand, out of her coat, she avoids having an encounter with this guy. So he's going to move on and try to find somebody else. And you kind of in, indicate you know, he'll continue stalking because here are two women out for a walk in the park. So I'm worried about them now. Um, and right after that happens, she's standing there and another man walks up and walks by. Um, and he has a, just a friendly smile, but she does not acknowledge him because she's getting this kind of crap all the time. This guy outnumbers this guy in her life. So it's kind of a very a Freudian symbolic thing. The next page is, is a wide shot of her uh, walking and she walks alone and she thinks about all this stuff and processes her life philosophy. But the big point here is that she continued, she gets to live and walk on. Uh, and it's because she has a side of her that is um, dangerous. Um, I don't know, I put a lot of Freudian stuff in there. One last little quick one. Um, here we are at a party and um, a bunch of people acting like buffoons, uh, led by Freddie. Uh, there's an old, jazz, old band, jazz band on the bandstand. Freddie's hollering out Freebird. Yeah, that's funny. I've never heard that before. Um, Kachu is at the party, um, and she is kind of looking for Francine, who is rumored to be here. Look, look, walking through the people, looking. Um, this old guy hits on her, puts him down. Look, oh, whoa, 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 sees that. That looks like the back of Francine's head onto Kachu's face. She was afraid that Francine would look frumpy after all this time. They haven't seen each other. And then she sees her from behind the crowd and Francine looks anything but frumpy. So this gets a lot of mental processing from Kachu. <laughs> so this is Francine with her husband at the time. And suddenly Francine gets a sixth sense feeling. Turns and looks. And there's your cowboy shot. Cowboy meaning like close in on the eyes and looking into someone's soul. And the, she didn't see anything. That feeling was there in her heart. 
So in this close-up cowboy shot, as they call it, notice that I gave a little uh, sad dent in the eye here without actually bringing the eyebrows together and causing uh, overacting with lines and expressions and too much expression. It's very subtle. That eye is looking normal. This eye with that little subtle uh, sad line, sad arc, indicates more of a concern in this look. And I, 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 that's really tough to catch sometimes. You don't want um, your characters overacting like a bad actor, which it would be emoting too much, too broad of an expression, as if they're on a stage playing to the back of the theater. This is, uh, for all basic purposes, this is uh, like television and movies. The camera is right there. The camera is right there. We can see every little twitch of your face. So the more subtle of an actress you can be with your character, the, the, the better the performance, right? Like, like great actors on TV. They're not all round, round. They're all like, hmm. You know, so you try to draw it that way too. It's the subtle things between that and that. Notice that the backgrounds here are a lot of blacks and people with their backs turned because I don't care what they look like. I don't care about their face. Nobody does. It's just people. It's just party people. And... Um, just enough of the sense of uh, party background. I didn't have to draw the entire ballroom with 200 people and a, and a bandstand and, and uh, uh, people serving food. So that's my um, that's my take on how I was framing. Um, I couldn't, you know, there's not enough time for me to draw this stuff out in a lesson, but that's kind of some examples from um, the books that I've made. I hope it's helpful. Um, and uh, it really is important. The first criticism I ever had from uh, a professional was that my, my storytelling had no sense of place because I wasn't doing enough backgrounds and getting setups uh, at the beginning of the sequences. So you have to go ahead and draw and put in the labor to get your uh, scene set up, get a sense of place, and then my style is to uh, shift focus to the characters. And we don't need to see the chair in the room every single time. Once you know there's a chair there, um, the, the reader will remember it. And anytime you don't have to show the chair, if the chair is not important for some reason, um, find a way not to show it anymore because you're wasting the viewer's attention. Focus on what you want them to focus on. And that's the whole point of framing it to begin with. Bear that in mind. Okay, see you guys next week.